Exponent rules. Do you guys remember this exponent rule? Can you give me an example with numbers? X squared times X cubed equals X to the fifth. X to the fifth. Can you give me an example with all numbers? Why does that work? Because when you're trying to get you're trying to get three, four times the times two times three times two times three, then you're gonna need three times three times three times three times three times three. And in the end you'll have ten threes, right? Now things get like that is easy to understand with whole numbers. But the interesting thing about the exponent rules is it extends even to fractions. So if I had x to the half times x to the half, right, it's hard to draw half an x. But if you have x to the half times x to the half, that would be like this. And what do you get? One half plus one half is one, so you just get x. Now on this side, we've learned some rules about square roots. You can multiply square roots together, right? Like if I had the square root of two times the square root of eight, what's that equal to? Square root of two times square root of eight is equal to the square root of 16, which happens to be 4, right? The square root of x times the square root of x would be the same thing as square root of, and what happens when I do x times x? I get x squared. Square rooting and squaring are the opposite of each other, right? So the square root of x squared is just the same as x. Notice that our answers are identical here. When I do square root of x times square root of x, I get x. When I do x to the half times x to the half, I get x. I was thinking about it. If you did half an x and then another half an x, you get 1x. I don't know if that actually works that way. Maybe. Argue. Is this equal to this? And why would you say so? I mean, we did the math on the left side here, we got x. We did the math on the right side, we got x. So these two things are the same. And it looks like I have two of these and two of those. So it appears to be that one of them should equal the other one. Does it work with other ones? What about if we actually use numbers? Will it still work? So compare these. How do you multiply fractions? Multiply the top, multiply the bottom. So if I put these together, I'm going to get 1 on the top and 9 on the bottom. And we remember with fractions, this is the same as square root of 1 over square root of 9. So this side is 1 third. And here I have the same base. So I can add the exponents.
and they're the same again. So square roots are related to exponents. Anytime you have a square root, you can say to yourself, I may want to write it as an exponent instead. Let's see if it works for other radicals. So here's in general what we see with square roots. Now, a has to be bigger than 0 because the square root of a negative doesn't exist. So the big idea of what we're looking at today is how we can change radicals to numbers with exponents to powers, and then we can use all of our power rules that you learned last year in grade 9 to work with radicals as well. I can go for X. this one here. Again, we can multiply all those fives together inside and you would get the cube root of 125. If you went to your perfect cubes, what's the cube root of 125? But, of course, you might have been able to see that here because we have three of them. That's the same as five cubed. And a cube root will cancel out a cube because they're opposite of each other. Now over here, we've got exponents with the same base. So we use our exponent rules. We should have an exponent rules test tomorrow. Yeah, because you, you have to know them. So that would be good. You... you no? You, do you know them? How, how, do you, how well do you know all your exponent rules from grade 9? It's expected, it's expected that you know them really, really, really well for grade 10. Are they good? No, they're not that good? Okay, well, we'll have to practice them. We won't have a test tomorrow. That would be not a bad thing. One-third plus one-third plus one-third is... is three-thirds. How do you add fractions? Add the numerators once a common denominator, and 5 to the 3 over 3 is the same as 5 to the 1, which is just 5. So once again, we get the same answer. So it appears the same thing is true for cube roots. The cube root of 5 equals 5 to the 1 third. What do you think the fourth root of 7 is equal to? Ben? 7 to the 1 fourth. Take out your calculator and let's check this out. Is it the same? So 
So fourth root, four math down to number five. Fourth root of seven, push enter, 1.626. And now we're going to try seven to the one quarter. Exactly the same. If you have an older calculator that the exponent doesn't go up like that, make sure that when you use this button, you put the one quarter in brackets. So if your calculator doesn't have, so make sure you check that to see if you can do that on your graphing calculator. They are the same. So we can start filling out this chart. We've got the rational exponent or the fractional exponent on the one side. So a to the one half is the same thing as square root of a. a to the one third, cube root of a. a to the one quarter, fourth root of a. And a to the one fifth is the fifth root of a. And here you get to use your fancy little symbols. Therefore, we can generalize this idea that a to the 1 over n is equal to the nth root of a. This means n is an, not an, a natural number. Of course, when you're writing definitions, mathematicians don't like to write out a lot of words. So they go to shorthand and start to use the symbols. I think I always draw the double line at the beginning, didn't I? It was drawn in the middle there. Ready? Oh, it's the mental math. I can go back. Let me know when you're done. Emily? Ready? This little E thing between the N and the N technically is, is an element of, so that's why it looks like an E element. But I think short term, it is a natural number. Makes just as much sense. Sometimes when this is, is read, this E you can say belongs to, N belongs to the natural numbers. <laughs> okay, so mental math. Now at the beginning, it's going to be easier for you to think of these as radicals. So what's another way that we can write 49 to the half? Square root of 49. Does that trigger the number 7 quicker than 49 to the 1 half does? Sort of. You can see that the answer is 7.
negative 27 to the one third. The cube root of negative 27. Can you take a cube root of a negative? Yes, you can. It'll be negative 3. Again, that's from your powers chart. And this will be cube root as well. Cube root of negative 8. Negative 2. Do you remember this? Exponent law. Now, all of the exponent laws, if you ever have a tough time remembering them, if you just go back to what does an exponent do? Exponent is repeated multiplication. Sort of the same way that Dawson did that first example where he broke it up and we could see four threes and then six threes and say there's going to be ten all together so it makes it three to the ten. The same thing can happen here. Choose some numbers. Let's go three squared to the 4. Well, all an exponent means is repeated multiplication. So the 3 squared, that's the same as 3 times 3 to the 4. Because that's what squared means, right? And the 4 would mean that we have 3 times 3 once, 3 times 3 a second time, 3 times 3 a third time, 3 times 3 a fourth time. So how many threes are there in total when they're all multiplied up? Three to the eight. Now when you see that, does the law make sense that we should go two times four and get three to the eight? So if you're ever like, oh, what's the exponent law again? Go back to the definition of an exponent. Think about it and you'll be able to write it out and figure it out. Don't just go, oh, I think it's this, and do that. That's a bad math strategy. That usually doesn't turn out well. So go back to the definition of what an exponent is, and you'll be able to figure out what the law is. Once you've figured out the law, then it makes sense that now you can use it for all sorts of numbers, including fractions. But this one, x squared to the 4 will be x to the 8. Now we can do some mental math. What is 4 to the 3 halves? Well, if we use this law, the power law, to break this up, we might be able to change things to radicals, which can help us figure things out. For example, Three halves is the same as one half times three. Can you see that? Three halves is the same as one half times three. Because you can think of three as a fraction as three over one. So I'm sort of working backwards from that power law that we just saw before, right? I have it already combined. I could break it up to be 1 half times 3. Why would that be helpful? Xander? We could change the half to square root of 4. You know the square root of 4? It's 2. And then, it's still half to the power of 3, and 2 to the power of 3 is 8. So there's our mental math. 4 to the 3 halves is 8. Thirty-two to the 2 fifths.
you could also have written it like this. Can you see that those are the same? Because 1 fifth times 2 is the same as 2 times 1 fifth. Now, for mental math purposes, it's better to do the fraction first, because that will make your numbers smaller. 32 squared is, very, is a very big number. And then to take the fifth root of that number would be quite difficult. But the fifth root of 32, does it exist? Is there a number when you multiply by itself five times equals 32? Two. When you're checking these, they're not going to be big numbers, right? Check two. Two times two is four, times two is eight, times two is 16, times two is 32. Once you get to the fifth root, they're not going to go to huge numbers because three times three times three times three times three is already 243, which is a huge number. So they're not going to be big numbers, so it's not going to be hard to check to find out that this is equal to 2. It still needs to be squared, which is 4. Another interesting thing, as sort of a side, when doing these, if you take 32, can you write it as a power? Well, we know 32 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. That's the prime factorization. We want to find 32 to the 2 fifths. Why don't we just take 2 fifths of that, 2 out of the 5? What's 2 times 2? 4. That works as well. So you can go to the fractions, or you can look at that pattern as well, if that makes sense to you. Do another one. What's 64 to the 2 thirds? 16. Good job. Right? Did you use this strategy or did you use this strategy? Both? Because 64 is 4 times 4 times 4. So 2 thirds of that would be 16. Or you could do 64 to the 1 third squared. Cube root of 64 is 4. 4 squared becomes 16. Sixty-four to the five-sixth. Yes. Yeah. Wait. Let everybody figure it out. Oh, yeah, did you get 32? One way you could do it is it's 64 to the 1 sixth to the power 5. That's 2 to the power 5, which is 32. Or if you wrote six, 64 out as a prime factorization, you get 6 twos. 5 out of those 6 twos would make 32. Here's the general rule. Now, one of the things that was in our general rule here is that the exponent must be in reduced form. The reason for this is because we could get something like negative 8 to the 2 sixths. And if you don't reduce the 2 sixths, 
right? Reduced to 2 sixths would be 1 third. But if I don't reduce the 2 sixths and I would have gone negative 8 to the 1 sixth squared, and notice because of the negative I had to add extra brackets, right? Algebraically, definitions of what order of operations are. If I'm going to put this negative 8 to the 1 sixth, the negative goes to the 1 sixth as, as well, which would be the sixth root of negative 8. The same problem with square roots happens with fourth roots, happens with sixth roots. When this is an even number, what is the square root of a negative? Can you take the square root of a negative? You can't take the fourth root of a negative. You can't take the sixth root of a negative. Anytime you have an even number and you're trying to take a root of a negative number, it's not possible. So if I left the 2 sixth as 2 sixth and I tried to solve it, the question would tell me it's not possible. But if I reduce the fraction, can you do the cube root of a negative? Yes. And the cube root of negative is negative 2, which is possible. Then it doesn't, then it gives you the right answer, right? If, oh, and then you get a positive number instead of the negative, yeah. So you have to reduce that fraction first. Yeah, that's a good point. So this is, the idea is, well, what happens if we did it like this? Then I'm going to get 64, wow, that's a bad looking bracket, to the 1 sixth, which gives me positive 2 which is a different answer as well. So the answer that is correct is this one. So there's reasons why we have things like fractions in lowest terms. Because in sometimes we get discrepancies in the answers unless we decide what's the proper way to do it. This is just some interesting stuff. This doesn't come up very often on quizzes and tests, but if you're wondering how you would do something like this because it sort of contradicts itself because you get different answers depending on the way you do it, that's why I had that little note in there. So here we have something in radical form and one of the skills you need to be able to do is change something from a radical form into an exponent form. One of the things while you're taking your math notes and you're in math class, like the key thing is you watch me do a question and you go, here he's got x to the 4 thirds. Well, the fourth root is 1 quarter, so you can change that. And then I have my power rule, 3 times 1 quarter, multiplying fractions, multiply the tops, multiply the bottoms. Here's our final answer. One of the dangers in a math class is you just watch this part, this step to this step to this step and go, okay, I can do that, but then you don't pay attention to the words at the beginning of a question, right? So now you have to make the connection, convert to exponential form, does that make sense to you? Do you understand what those words are saying? So that when you get this on a quiz, you don't have one of those blanks moments where you're like, oh, I blanked. Well, the reason you're bl maybe blanking is because you're not paying attention to what the instructions are. Here, we're converting to exponential form. What does exponential form mean? That means writing it with an exponent 
everything with an exponent. So that's part of it is saying, okay, now I know what an exponential form is. This right now is a radical form. So sometimes I might ask to convert to a radical form. So just paying attention to those details during class can also help you on quizzes and tests just for understanding what you're supposed to do. Because that happens sometimes. You're like, I knew how to do it in class, but on a quiz I don't. And part of it is taking time to look at what the question is asking. Another key word, evaluate. There's the answer. I'm going to come around and, and check your work. Different methods. The method we've been using the most has been this, where 3 halves is equal to 3 times a half. A half is the same as a square root. This becomes 2. 2 cubed is 8. That's using the power law. I saw someone also doing this using your product law. Can you see that 1 plus a half is 3 halves? So this is equal to that. And then you get 4 times the square root of 4, which is 4 times 2, which is 8 as well. So you're allowed to use your exponent rules however you like to break it up. So if you saw the right-hand way first, perfect. Add here to this one and simplify. So we want exponential form and simplify. And we're going to start next class with that because the bell is about to go, but I will show you your homework so you can start on it. We'll get a little bit of time in class tomorrow to work on this as well.